Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition, another fantastic edition of Let's Talk. I am Laughing Boy LP, and tonight um, he has just completed a month ago his uh, Let's Play of Phantom Hourglass. Uh, we have Chugga Conroy over with us today. Hey everybody, thank you for having me, and with that introduction of like, he is just completed, he made it sound like I just got done with a month-long boxing match against Phantom Hourglass. <laughs> which... He is tired, he is bruised. Oh yeah, yeah, like, no, like, the, the Temple of the Ocean King gave me a right thrashing, draining the life out of me, and, you know, I had Ciela swinging that hammer all around, and <laughs> <laughs> it was a rough time, it really was, and there were certain things that were just way more tedious than they needed to be. Okay, no, I don't mean to talk all negative here, because it's not what this is about. <laughs> Uh, but we will be talking about Phantom Hourglass. Uh, this will be a brand new thing for my channel where I've, you know, mostly for Let's Talk, I, I try to talk about specifically how people go through um, their own process. But I've always wanted to do something where we can sort of touch base and um, I think maybe talking about a previously completed Let's Play is, is sort of like the best way to talk about your process and maybe how it's changed since we've done our initial interview, which you should definitely check out on my own channel. Thank you, Zelda Universe, for hosting this. Um, so for starters, uh, so you've done Phantom Hourglass. That is a <laughs> Zelda game. It is on Zelda Universe. I am talking out of my ass. <laughs> Let's talk about the background of your Let's Play a little bit. Uh, so, first thing I want to go over is what was the actual inspiration that made you choose this game for your 39th Let's Play? Okay, so um, there's a there's a channel uh, called Nicola Nintendo who I've followed for a long time. Uh, she's somebody that I talk to from time to time as well. She Let's Played the game years ago. Um, she's actually done multiple attempts at it where it was one of her first projects and she redid it later. Uh, from watching her, I was inspired to play the game again. I did play it when it was new, uh, but I didn't finish it. And from replaying it uh, after that, um, I just thought it was a very interesting game. It's not always a good experience, but there were a lot of little things about it that I thought were good that just weren't very talked about. And that was what made me want to do it. Right. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely wanted to go into the uh, background, especially since I think she, Nicola, had gotten most of the way through. I can't remember if she wound up finishing that LP. I actually remember seeing that when she was releasing it. It is finished now. It is finished now. Yes. Um, but yeah, it was it was a sight to see, especially back then when trying to record 3DS footage or DS footage was really difficult to come by. Um. And kind of going into that, I do remember you mentioning that you wanted to LP it some time ago, but you just weren't able to do so until recently. Was there a specific reason for that? There was the fact that DS games were not always easily recorded. Um, hardware modifications that allowed you to record it were not common, and the Wii U Virtual Console did not exist at the time. So really the only method was a camcorder for the longest time. And I didn't want to go that route. But when DS Capture became a thing, Phantom Hourglass was one of the first ideas I had, not only from just thinking it was an interesting game, but um, also because I'd realized that watching someone play it can be superior to playing it in presentation because your hand's not blocking the screen. And that's one of the biggest complaints with the game. Sometimes you can't see things on coming. So I realized that watching someone play the game might look a little cleaner than playing it yourself. And I realized that's something that you could get through a Let's Play video. Uh, and I thought that'd be interesting. Well, I think thinking about that, there's almost like a a lesser uh, risk reward scenario for watching an, an LP rather than playing the game yourself, um, especially with something that was sort of as divisive as Phantom Hourglass was, especially at the time. So I mean, it, uh, because you're watching me, you don't have to play through the Temple of the Ocean King six times. But that's right. <laughs> no, I'm mean, not. I, I'm not going to say that like watching me is like better than playing the game. I'm just saying, I think in the way of presentation, it's a lot more welcoming if there's not constantly a hand in front of the screen, and if yeah. a game that's rife with backtracking, you don't see that right away. But I tried to present it as accurately as I could. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it just it gives more of a positive aspect to to the game um, when you not, aren't necessarily risking the amount of time that you would be spending in it, and you can kind of see it through somebody else's perspective. 
there were still a lot of people that said that they picked it up from that and that yeah the backtracking kind of sucks though but they were still glad that they played it and that made me really glad to see because i i always try to encourage people to play the game themselves i never want to replace a playthrough um so in terms of actually recording your footage so did you wind up using a 3ds capture unit or did you use the wii u virtual console Neither actually. I used a uh, DS capture. I used a DS capture unit, not a 3DS. My um, goodness! I did that this way because I wanted pixel perfect graphics. Um, I feel like the whole debate of do you want anti aliasing from a 3DS or perfect aspect ratios and all that—it's largely subjective. No matter which one you choose, somebody will tell you that you're wrong. <laughs> but right. I wanted it for uh, this game in particular. Um, just because I felt like my uh, Pokemon black and white videos turned out a lot blurrier than I would have liked. So I kind of went pixel perfect this time. And believe it or not, even though the Wii U version is an official release of the game and it is running in an official like Nintendo developed emulator for the DS, there's no pixel perfect mode available at all. You can play with smooth graphics and there is a smoothing filter off option but the pixels do not perfectly translate one to one and it's really obvious in the menus where the text is all jagged and various boxes in the menus are different sizes yeah so it's it's do i believe it's just due to the fact that it's not a good one to one ratio between the DS's aspect and the like a 1080p aspect right I think the uh, Wii U outputs DS at 1280 by 720, and it just doesn't, and, and it stretches. It doesn't actually run the game in a higher resolution. Yeah. Because it stretches to 1280 by 720, it's not a perfect, um, it's not a perfect one to one stretch of 256 by 192, which is the DS screen resolution. Right. And so you're going to see some issues in terms of what that's going to look like when it actually translates, and especially when you try to move that over to eventually youtube it just it's it will show up in the text especially people are going to be watching on all sorts of things and i just felt like for this specific game especially with the menus looking the way they do that i'd want it to look as good as it possibly could and the wii u version just was not that right um and i do i personally definitely agree with that um there's actually quite a few youtube channels out there that you can look up um if you are interested in learning more about um, videos, aspect ratio, especially in terms of the resolutions of different games and how to perfectly port that over to a TV. Um, you can definitely, this is for our viewers, uh, you can definitely check out uh, My Life in Gaming and they have a lot of great information that you can look up if you guys are interested in that. Oh, no, that's good information. I didn't know about that, sh about that channel having that kind of info, actually, so thank you for pointing it out. You're welcome. Uh, so... What were some of the difficulties that you did encounter with recording DS games? So, for a long time, there was there there was no good way of doing it, really. Right. Um, I can actually tell this story. Um, <laughs> th this is uh this is a very painful experience that is very close to me and it is very relevant to this. Okay. Before there was a good way of recording DS games, I'd gotten in contact with people that had technical know-how, and uh, I was trying to develop essentially my own way of recording DS games because I was pretty sure that an official solution hadn't happened by this point. It's probably never going to happen. Um, for whatever reason, Nintendo just was not interested in giving us a way to play these games on a TV or with video output, so I began working on my own method, <laughs> which actually did see completion. Doing this, uh, doing this cost me $2,000 of my own money because there was nobody mass producing this stuff at the time. Ugh. I got it working, was ready to do my first DS project, so I started working on my first DS Let's Play of Okami Den, and before I could get it out, that was when Loopy started selling these things for 100 bucks. <laughs> Comes that's, out of nowhere, and suddenly, so whoop, cheaper. you can buy them for 100 bucks, and people were... <laughs> Swooping up DS capture units and putting out DS Let's Plays before me. <laughs> oh, it was such painful. a painful experience, and there was no way to see it coming. That is a gut punch. Yep. Oh my god. But um, um, that that was a big challenge with recording DS in the early days when there was no good way of doing it. Was I was that determined to do it, but I was just a few months too early. So a quick question: Is the DS unit that you were using to record Phantom Hourglass was that? also a loopy device yes um okay i don't 
want to promise that you can do this because I don't know. But 3DS capture units you can no longer get. That's right. DS units, there is a chance that maybe you can. Um, on Loopy's website, there is a link to DS capture instead of 3DS capture. If you click that link, the order button is still able to be clicked and you can go through the process. And on his support forum, there are still there are people as recently as December of last year saying that they got orders from it. Hmm. It's possible that DS capture units might be available, but I haven't gone through the steps. I don't know. I just yeah. found that and thought it was interesting, and it might be helpful to somebody who wants to do that, because even if it's not a 3DS capturing unit, a DS unit is still a lot better than nothing. Yeah, and especially if you want to record um, even... I don't know how well it works for GBA, does it? Um, It works decently well. Um, okay. You can use it as a way of recording GBA if you don't want to get component cables for your GameCube and all that stuff. Right. Uh, so were there any other difficulties that you encountered, especially with Phantom Hourglass? Were there any other challenges that you faced? In the way of recording, not overly. It was just a matter of playing all the different versions, seeing what I like the best, and doing a lot of comparisons. Um, but in the way of recording DS games, I've done it so many times that it's really not a big surprise to me anymore. There's nothing that's really come up that's been unexpected. I guess that's fair. Um, uh, yeah, I would not play this game on the virtual console is basically what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Even just for fun. All right. Uh, so one of the things that I kind of wanted to talk about, and this is definitely a recording question. Uh, so the postman. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why did you make his voice so creepy? Well, why did they make his face so creepy? <laughs> <laughs> the man's talking out of his teeth the postman is so bad and um actually it's funny in spirit tracks they make fun of how bad the phantom hourglass postman is they knew <laughs> <laughs> the, the 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 spirit tracks postman hands you the letters and you have an inventory for them now and the very first time he shows up he goes yeah apparently some people didn't like us reading their letters out loud to them <laughs> Well, when you use that voice. But uh, I think your comment section actually started talking about what he was. So yeah. could you elaborate on that? I had some theories about him. I was thinking that the postman might be a Rito because uh, this is established to take place after Wind Waker and there are no other Rito in the game. So we can't really compare what a Rito would look like in the world of the Ocean King. Um. He looks a, quite a bit different. Like, he doesn't have the beak on his face, but I was thinking, you know, is he a Rito? Is he a human? Or is he just some other race altogether? Is he undefined? Because there's no official text about it. People looked at his model, and it's hard to see this on a DS, but his wings are actually strap-ons. He actually holds onto a strap that is over his shoulders to keep his wings on when he flies. So the wings are artificial, and he's just a human. Oh. And uh, don't worry that I definitely chuckled when you said that word. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> That's right. Uh, all right. Well, I didn't know he wore a strap on. Great. So a lot of your fan base, um, speaking of your comment section, a lot of your fan base has really taken to your creative map notes, like especially with the names that you gave your posts, like mm -hmm. postopia.com, etc. cetera. Um, <laughs> Did you anticipate that fan reaction? I I was a little surprised. There were people um there were people that were trying to suggest names for future posts and I even used some of the ones that I saw. Um probably my my favorite instance of note taking was I think in the second dungeon where I wrote down everything that the stone tablet said verbatim and just made a huge mess of the screen even <laughs> writing over areas I'd already written on. <laughs> that that well, was fun. It was it was nice seeing all the creative ways that like you can take notes in that game, and I tried being as ridiculous with it as I could. And uh, I'm I'm just a big fan of the feature how you take down notes, you create your own maps of areas that don't have them, like that one, like the um the Uncharted Island. You solve the puzzle by making your own map. It kind of takes you back to the Zelda one days and turns it into a game mechanic inside the actual game. And I think that that's one of Phantom Hourglass's strong points that is an experience you can't really get elsewhere. Yeah, I think that was a really great idea, and I feel like maybe that was even the impetus of why they wanted to have a Zelda game on the DS, so that you could actually, like, especially in terms of, of how Metroidvania games had become more the norm by that point, being able to kind of have a note device on your system and being able to kind of be like, okay, 
I just need to remember to come back here when I have something that allows me to use this. Totally. Um, it was it was such a great idea, uh, especially this like Phantom Hourglass was my first DS game, and while I was really annoyed by having to use the touchpad as a controller, mm-hmm. uh, I really loved the note taking aspect of it. It's very creative, and uh, by that point, the uh, the feeling of playing Zelda One and Zelda Two had been lost for you know two decades by that point. Um. Because nowadays, if you made a game where you have to have a pencil and paper handy and you have to be drawing your own maps and taking notes and stuff, that's just going to get seen as bad game design. Nobody does that anymore. But yeah. if you make it a game mechanic and you design the game around it, then it no longer is. They give you the tools to succeed without you having to have certain things with you or be in a certain scenario. And that's part of why I think Phantom Hourglass is an experience you can't get elsewhere. You also have just really wild stuff that uses the features of the DS very well. Yeah, and we can, we'll talk definitely more about that in future questions. Um, but for now, I think going back to that anticipation, uh, I know that for some Let's Players, the, their recording schedule makes it so that they really can't respond to a fan's comments or maybe some of like the memes that get created within their series. Do you think that your recording schedule in particular allowed you to see that fan reaction as well as kind of enabling you to play along with that more? Um, I'm a very active person on my Twitter, so if people notify me of things there, I'm pretty likely to see them. I read the comments that I can, uh, but I'm not very familiar with having a recording schedule. My mindset (laughs) has always been that I do what I want, and if I want to record that day, then I do. If I don't, I don't. And if I go a bunch of days in a row where I'm just not able to record, I try not to sweat it too much. Um... I kind of... I'm kind of a believer in making sure that the video is finished and not just posting... You know, just posting a disposable video that day for the sake of having something to watch for that one day. Right. Uh, yeah, and I know that for some Let's Players, especially when they do blind LPs, um, they might be day or you know episodes and episodes ahead of what you're seeing right now. And so I, I know like a lot of the comments on those types of games or those types of Let's Plays rather will have like, dude, don't worry, sh-, you know, blah blah figures it out. Mm-hmm. You just have to wait a couple more episodes because they're just they're behind or they're ahead rather i I record a few episodes ahead so that i can keep a semi-consistent basis but i try not to go too far ahead because i don't want to miss things for you know miss permanent things it's it's a hard balancing act is basically what i'm saying because you want to be ahead so that you can post consistently but you don't want to be too far ahead that you can't get help (laughs) yeah exactly um, so let's move it all right along over to sort of how the editing and the production of the Let's Play, of which I don't have many questions, apparently. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, that was easy. Uh, yeah, I know. It's real easy. So one of the, the main questions that I wanted to talk about, um, because I know that this was a, sort of a, a new starting point in terms of your Let's Play production, but who helped you with the art assets for this Let's Play? So all the visual design that you saw was done by Motion Dan. He's a uh, an editor who helps me with TRG, and he's also uh, Stephen George's editor for Stephen Plays. Uh, okay. Previously, Stephen himself was the person who did all my visual design, but this was the first one that Dan was the leader on, and he made the backdrops, he made the end card, and any sort of other visual design that I needed for the series, he was the one who made it. And I think he did a great job tying it all together, making everything look like sea maps and stuff like that. Yeah, I I really liked how clean everything really looked. Um, it was it had character, but not too much to the point where it was overbearing. Basically, I can agree there. Yeah, it was yeah. it did its job as a it, his backdrop did a very good job, not being overbearing, but looking in the style of the game. And it's also just fun to have things look old, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, yeah, we're done with editing. Um. <laughs> Do you let let's talk a little bit about sort of it's been it's been a little while since the let's play has been out and available and finished. Do you think that you were able to maybe change some people's opinions over Phantom Hourglass as a I've game? Had, I've had people tell me that even if they didn't enjoy playing it, they had a fun time watching it. And I've had other people tell me that they've gone back and played it again and they do have a higher opinion of it now. But I absolutely get a lot of the criticism that it does get. I don't think the touch controls are bad. That's the one that I very fundamentally disagree on because I think they did a very good job translating the items in a way that makes sense. And some items like the boomerang got huge upgrades and they do things they could never do in other Zelda titles. Yeah, and some of it I forgot until I saw you playing it. 
Yeah, it's really intuitive to use a lot of the items with the touchscreen. Um, I mean, you got the hammer. I mean, come on, the hammer is the most overpowered <laughs> item in any Zelda title. <laughs> Let's be real. Um, I think I all by going into. I always like to go into the side modes and show everything that a game is. And I had a lot of people say that they didn't realize how detailed of a game it is. How even the fairies that travel with you are upgradable. They have powers of their own that you can put together with links. Um, how you're putting you're basically drawing out a map of the world as you go along and it's super detailed um th th there's a lot to it it's not just a standard handheld game that is very simplified compared to how the console games were at the time it very much feels like a big adventure but i will say i do agree on the backtracking being a lot i do agree on some things not being very intuitive such as how you switch out ship parts and your ship being upgradable because uh, the ship parts are not well organized. There's certain things about it that definitely do bring down the experience that you run into more than a few times. Yeah, uh, and quite a lot of it, when I was watching your LP, I had not played the game in about 10 years, 11 years. Um, so there was a lot of remembrance in it for me. Uh, and I, th I definitely personally felt like maybe it's not quite as bad as I gave it... Um, kind of as I gave it shit for back in the day that, that's, but I that's... still think I'd have the same agreements I didn't do the, a lot of the ship part stuff though that, that's that's kind of what I was going for was for as much as I gushed about lineback and as much as I praised some of the dungeon design and a lot of the puzzles for being very creative um I wasn't trying to oversell it either I wasn't trying to say oh this game's amazing you know it's brilliant why can <laughs> no one see the genius of, that is Phantom Hourglass no I wasn't going for that at all I was this game is good. It has its issues, but I think people are a little hard on it. That's kind of the approach that I was taking. Yeah, and that's definitely understandable. Um, but one of the things I know you did talk about was that the music in this game wasn't really... It didn't really stack up for you in terms of other Zeldas. Um, do you mind least. going a little... <laughs> I was going to say, do you mind going over that a little bit? Yeah. So, um, this is a criticism I didn't see brought up at any point when I was looking up things about the game or whenever I've talked about it, talked about it with other people, I think Phantom Hourglass has a bad soundtrack and it hurts me to say that about a main Zelda title, but I do think it is the example of it. Um, you have separate dungeon themes, separate dungeon theme songs go a very long way to making them stand out. Ocarina time did a beautiful job with this. Um, the tracks in Majora's Mask might not be great songs on their own in all cases, but they set the mood of the dungeon and you definitely remember the atmosphere. Yeah. And that became the norm by that point. From Ocarina onward, it was very much a thing that each area had its own distinct music. Even as far back as Link's Awakening, you were getting that where a lot of areas had unique themes. Yeah. And they were just slightly different enough where you kind of go like, is this dungeon theme different from the last one? It is. It's, it, it goes a very long way to giving areas their own identity. Yeah. Even before that, I, even in Link to the Past where you had a generic dungeon theme, it was still a good song. Yeah. Phantom Hourglass throws all that out the window. It has one dungeon theme. It's just... Dun, 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 Repeating for... It's not even a good song. It's a 15-second loop of incredibly generic sounds... Nothing memorable about it, and it's lame because some of the dungeons are such creative ideas or have really memorable puzzles, and I don't know, backtracking through the Temple of the Ocean King might not have been so bad if it had good music playing during it, at least. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that they all use the same thing, and then you also have, there is one generic town theme. There is one generic island theme. They didn't compose yeah. that many songs for it. Um, the only good songs that I can even name at all are Linebeck's theme, which is background music and a couple of cutscenes, and even then that song is not that long, so I wouldn't listen to it for a long period of time outside of those cutscenes. Mm -hmm. There's the sailing theme, which, while a great song, and I definitely agree with it being the main theme of the game, it's pretty heavily inspired by the sailing theme in Wind Waker, and I wouldn't say that it has as much of an identity as you'd expect a main theme of a game too. It is a great song, definitely. And besides that, you got the final boss themes that you hear at the end of the game and everything else that I can remember being decent is just lifted from either Ocarina of Time or Wind Waker. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I think one of my, once you broke that for me, I could not stop hearing the underground theme every like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. 
You hear you hear the same songs the entire time, and they're not even good. Yeah, they're very generic. Yeah, it's, I definitely it's, agree with that. It's so strange too, though, that a Zelda game can have a super generic soundtrack, but I think this one absolutely does, and it's one of the biggest downsides of it that I didn't really see talked about. And uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I hate to say it though, but I feel like when you have two good songs and then the remainder of the decent parts of the soundtrack are just verbatim lifted from other games. That is a bad <laughs> soundtrack. No, it, it makes perfect sense. I mean, it, I understand maybe from the odd, uh, the idea that maybe you're trying to like, Hey, this is the same world and the same ideas from the last game. But at the same time, it, it definitely seems like something had to go when they were creating this game. And apparently it was the music department. I find it so weird that it wasn't a high priority, though. Maybe they just didn't have enough time to get it done, or the music was done late in development. I, I can't say for sure, because I wasn't there. And there's not a whole lot of facts out there about Phantom Hourglass's development. It was hard to find stuff, actually, because Hyrule Historia and Zelda Encyclopedia, I think, each only have two pages written about it. Yeah, it's definitely not the most... That and Spirit Tracks are definitely not the most talked about Zelda games. In, Spirit in Tracks had more material, like a lot more. <laughs> Maybe they just but had by comparison, at least. Yeah. Um. So going into uh, other features, uh, we've kind of talked about a little bit of this before earlier in the in the episode, but Phantom Hourglass utilizes a lot of features that are inherent in the DS, which makes sense. It was sort of like it was almost like a. Uh, what's the term i'm looking for uh like a tour de force of what the ds was about the microphone the ability to use the microphone folding the screens together for a puzzle <laughs> which i oh my god when i saw that the first time playing it it was like oh that's really clever that's, that's such really a good, cool it's such a good fourth wall joke as a puzzle it really is um, and I don't really think I ever saw that ever again in any other games. But uh, where do you think that this game really excelled and or failed in terms of utilizing the DS? There are times where the gestures don't read well. I acknowledge that. Um, I'm also not a huge fan of how you roll in the game, and they, they, they improved on that, I think, in Spirit Tracks, where the rolling is a little bit different, where it's not drawing little circles on the edge of the screen anymore. I don't even remember that. I Now that you mention it, that's another one of my oh yeah moments. But I will say that in Zelda games, I love it when you can whip out your spin attacks like they're nothing if you know how, and Phantom Hourglass delivers on that front. Yeah, I think the items were very intuitive and, and translated very well into the touchscreen. I mentioned the boomerang earlier being good. Phantom Hourglass has my favorite iteration of the bombs. They're extremely useful and practical in combat, which a lot of people I know just avoid them in combat in other games, but not in this one. They're very convenient to use. Uh, your sword is just the right length that you can poke them. They were very thoughtful with designing the items this time around and making sure that they worked well. Um, hammer is a joy is just pure canned <laughs> death and a joy to use. Yeah. Um, if they ever make a Zelda tennis game, there needs to be a Cielo with a hammer as a playable character. I'm just saying... I mean, Hyrule Warriors too. <laughs> that'd be that'd be man if they had representation of Phantom Hourglass in that game. Oh, um, oof. But uh, never say never, man. Yeah, maybe. But I think that the items translated very well. I've already said my piece about the maps and why I think that's great. Mm -hmm. um, I personally am a lover of that puzzle where you have to fold the screens together like you are. I yeah. could not believe it the first time that I I did that. <laughs> I I thought it was so cool and wow, that's a great fourth wall joke, and it's very cryptic, but it explains itself just well enough that I think you could get it. Yeah, absolutely. If, if there's any item that I think is kind of generic, I guess I'd say the bow and arrow, though, but no, I think I think they did a good job translating it. It translated the gameplay, at least. I think really looking back on it with maybe, you know, rose-tinted glasses, uh, it really did have a lot of really cool and nifty ideas, and I definitely remember... Even my sort of weird anti ds self being like, all right, that puzzle was really cool. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it definitely had some really cool ideas that I really like, especially going back and watching you play it and remembering a lot of it. It had some really interesting ideas. This kind of furthers uh, something that I've said about another Zelda title. Um, I said that it was a huge shame that a game like Skyward Sword came out at the very end of the Wii's lifespan when most people were over motion <laughs> controls. 
And that if something like that could have come out in the first year or two of the Wii being out, I think history might have been a little different. It's... I really like Skyward Sword. I do, too. (laughs) I I do, too. I I think the controls are super fun when you get the hang of them, and there's lots of cool stuff that you can do in the combat when you understand it well. The pairing is so satisfying. It is my favorite part of the game, honestly. Just, like, being able to take the nunchuck and just push it, and and it just feels so good when you get that feedback. It's... I I think it's a good game, but it came out at a time where people were just kind of done with motion controls because people were waiting for that one big game that would just be a huge epic adventure that would use them in that way and it came out at the very end of the system's lifespan because it had such a troubled production yeah exactly and a lot of people joke that that was the reason why nintendo doesn't do e3 presentations anymore (laughs) oh yeah because the wireless (laughs) interference and the controls not working on screen i remember watching that and being like well the wii's dead and i I think wasn't was that the same one where they had donkey kong returns and i think i was like wait no i actually want a wii now uh, I'm pretty sure that's the case because I think that was the same year as Epic Yarn when they first showed it off. Because, uh, yeah, when they first showed it off, it was just a tech demo of running around in uh, Farron Woods hitting b- uh, Bacoblins. Or trying to hit Bacoblins. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, yeah. I, I thought it was kind of. Because um, I remember that uh, what Bill Trennan said on stage was, you know, hey, we asked you guys, can you turn off your cell phones? And I'm thinking, you're doing a press media briefing. <laughs> These people. <laughs> guys they would get fired if they turned off their cell phones <laughs> i can i'm live tweeting this shit your reaction to phantom hourglass kind of solidifies something that i've thought about skyward sword for a while that a game coming like that early in the system's lifespan that translates the items of zelda very well into the new control scheme is imperative for getting the system in people's hands it really is um and i definitely agree with that so last question hey where would you rank this game in terms of your list of favorite Zelda titles? Oh, God. <laughs> don't I do feel it. like I was inspired by Cody with this question. Don't don't quote me on that. Well, I would not say that it's top five material. <laughs> I, I would not say that. I like the game. It has its strong points. has moments that I really, really love. But I wouldn't go that far with it. Um... <laughs> I would say that it's one of the lesser Zelda games, but the fact that it still has so many intriguing things about it, it had so many things that I was excited to show people who had never seen it before, and I can still honestly say that I had a fun time with the gameplay at least, at least the core gameplay and combat mechanics, I think that that shows just how strong the merits of the Zelda series are, that I can say it is definitely one of the lesser ones but it still has that many cool things about it that I was excited to talk about. Yeah. I mean, I think really it is a tech demo, which was the word I was looking for earlier, of the DS's features. And maybe it was a little clouded in terms of what it they the game wanted to do. And maybe some aspects of other Zelda games sort of got left behind in terms of trying to see, like, this is what a Zelda game can look like, on a device that does so many different and interesting things and here's how we can make the weapons work and here's how we can make the items work personally Um, i'm 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 kind of sad that uh i will say if there's one thing i am a little sad about it's the fact that the sequel to wind waker had to kind of get the tech demo treatment because um i don't know if you know this but um twilight princess started out development as phantom hourglass Yes, there was a re- um, they they put a sequel to Wind Waker in production for the GameCube immediately after the engine was built and everything was finalized and they were sure it was going to be a big hit and then it was the fan reception to Wind Waker's initial announcement that caused them to sack that save their ideas for later and just make Twilight Princess instead and the idea a lot of the ideas made their way into Phantom Hourglass but I do think that as somebody who loves Wind Waker so much it is a little bit of a shame that the follow-up to Wind Waker got the tech demo treatment and not the main console installment treatment. Yeah, but I think at the same time, um, if it had come out on the GameCube or or anything like that, uh, it probably wouldn't have been able to kind of shine as what are these cool things that can be done with new technology and I think Maybe if it had come out, it would have been a late GameCube. It would have gotten the same treatment as Twilight Princess, which when moved over to the Wii, I, I feel like we probably would have still been in a, a same scenario. 
maybe. Mm-hmm. So that, that could be the case. Um, I don't hate Twilight Princess or anything. I was just saying that, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, uh, in terms of like the Twilight Princess sort of was a GameCube game and a Wii game. And so when it goes on to the Wii, it doesn't really do anything that the Wii could really like shine with uh, and, you're, as you're we were say, talking you're saying about that earlier it's like the wii version of twilight it, w- it would have been the wii version of twilight princess that sort of tacked on motion controls and the way that it ended up going it might not have been as spectacular of a product but it was at least able to be that flagship that showed what the d- what a system could do yeah exactly okay exactly. i see what you mean that's 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 an interesting trade-off way to think about it yeah um, well, that's it. That's all the questions that I had. Uh, I think that ran at a decent time, <laughs> considering. Yeah, you got me thinking about that. I, I hadn't really thought of it that way before, but yeah, I guess I kind of take back what I said about thinking it was kind of a shame. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a big deal, uh, but I mean, it, it's, it does create an interesting scenario, like a what-if scenario. Um, but yeah, it, it's while it does lose certain Zelda qualities, I think, in terms of what people expected at that point, it does shine in a different way um and sort of makes the way for more innovative fe- you know features as time went on mm-hmm. um but yeah uh definitely thanks thank you for joining me on this uh again thanks to zelda universe for allowing me to host an episode on their channel um if you like everything you see here uh i definitely have 10 episodes <laughs> of <laughs> chugga conroy content on my own channel you can go to laughing boy lp on youtube where uh we've had our three year ago recording of our uh, initial mm. interview with you. And well, I know a lot of things have changed since then. <laughs> thank you so much for having me on. Uh, before I go, I, I want to point out that um, my recording file for this, I titled it The Boy Who Laughs Sometimes Talks About the Timepiece of Dead People. That might have to be the episode title. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you know why this ti- video is so awkwardly titled. You're welcome. <laughs> but uh yeah, you've um is there uh, you know, let's talk about it. Do you have anything that you would like to promote that's upcoming for you? Uh well, assuming that you take more than 4 days to edit this. I will take more than 5 days to edit this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> perfect, perfect, perfect. I have just started a let's play of Chrono Trigger, one of my favorite games and one of the most well-regarded RPGs of the Super Nintendo era and for a lot of people of all time actually. And very excited about that and that's what I'm in the middle of right now. Great. Uh, so you can go ahead and check out Chugger Conroy's channel right now. Go ahead and check it out right now. He's probably already on episode 20. It's been days um so yeah de- definitely go and check that out i'll have to see how close you were to the claim <laughs> <laughs> right now four I, episodes exist at, at least at least but uh yeah definitely thanks for dropping by and we'll see you guys next time All right, good thank night you.